Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, today there's going to be a rocket launch just after dark, and uh, I thought it would be really cool to actually get up in the plane, fly south a little, get a little closer, and see it earlier. So, yeah, I've got this wild idea that I'm going to go flying and uh, catch a rocket in flight. I don't know. Just let's see if it works. Oh, look at the oh, plume. Oh, oh baby. The jellyfish. Jellyfish. So yeah, from my home just north of the Golden Gate Bridge, it is actually possible to see rocket launches from Vandenberg, which is about 250 miles south of me. But this one was going to be launching about 12 minutes after sunset, and so while I knew that we would get a bit of the twilight effect, it wasn't really going to be dark enough to experience it from my home. Now if you go to Southern California, it's further east, the sun is basically setting earlier relative to us, and so if I headed southeast, I would get a little more time on that, but on top of that we would be higher up so we might see further across the curvature of the earth and we might even be able to see the landing burn which would be happening further away to the west of Mexico. NOS traffic lights for 5905 Delta Yankee turning, right crosswind runway 31 NOS. So that's the theory and it turns out that I had a co-conspirator for this so I had to first of all fly the short distance from my home field over to Napa to pick him up. Napa Tower, 595 Delta Yankee, midfield right, downwind runway 19 right. Wind 45 Delta Yankee, runway 19 right, clear to land, wind 190 at 7. 595 Delta Yankee, clear to land, runway 19 right. Yeah, my uh, tower communication skills are, are not great right now. So yeah, you watch here, pulling in the flaps there, these are manual flaps, there's a, like a, a switch under there that lets you release them and slide them back to a notch. But there's no electrics or hydraulics, it's literally a connection between that lever and these flaps to you know, let the plane fly slower. And for the non-aviation people, that was me announcing that I was on the downwind, that is I'm parallel to the runway, travelling in the opposite direction of my landing, I'm a thousand feet high, and what you do is you begin your descent and you fly a U-turn through base to final and to landing. Mostly I fly to like small uncontrolled airports, Napa has much wider runways, so you know, you've got to be careful because when you have a wide runway there's a real like visual cueing that makes people tend to round out a little higher and then they find themselves higher above the runway and land a little hard. Turns out that I hadn't forgotten how to do this. Landing was just fine. The tower communication not so good. X45 Delta Yankee, turn left at Fox Track, cross runway 19 or left, safe parking. Uh, we'll head into the old hangars at Alpha 3. That's perfect, Delta Yankee, cross one then or left at Foxtrot, taxi to park you via Foxtrot Alpha Alpha 3 with me. Foxtrot, Foxtrot Alpha 3, cross runway one right or left. See, what I was supposed to do was read back my taxi instructions first and then tell him where I was supposed to park, but because I just told him where I was going to park, he uh, just had to reread the instructions twice. I I'm sorry. It's hard to imagine that someone that talks to people on the internet has a really hard time talking to air traffic controllers across the radio. Now to set expectations, we weren't going to fly all the way down to Vandenberg, which is that little bit that sticks out on the coast. No, we were just going to fly about 100 miles south so that we could come back when it was still twilight so that we could land a little more safely. And if you're wondering why we didn't just go straight there, it's because we wanted to avoid all of San Francisco Airport's airspace. That's defined by those blue uh, lines, that big polygon. But there was an interesting uh, extra thing on our route. If you look down there, there's HBAL 676. This was this is a high altitude balloon that we had just happened to see on our ADSB, and we wanted to see what we well see what it looked like. Of course, it was really high up. Even when we were directly underneath us, it was still 50,000 feet higher, and that was like nine and a half miles. So the image quality we got back really wasn't much. Yeah, it just looks like a smudge. Yeah, that's all I end up with. Yeah. It, but that is, that is a balloon. Yeah. It's, it's not, uh, not moving like an aircraft. Now, Craig in the East Bay, he sent me this image this morning. You can see the outline of the envelope and there is a payload hanging underneath it. This apparently belongs to a company called Aerostar, which makes something called the Thunderhead Balloon System. As of right now, it's still over the East Bay, hanging out just east of Mount Diablo. But for my flight, well, we were headed south. Where were we headed? Well, uh, we, what we did was we plugged in Vandenberg Space Force Base into our navigation system and it pointed us right at it. And then as we headed south, we watched the sun set. And interestingly, because we were at an altitude of about four kilometers, 
that meant that the sun set from our altitude was about two minutes later than the people on the ground directly below us. Our visible horizon was out to like 120 nautical miles from this altitude. Oh my god, it's getting exciting! Oh, the sun is almost gone. Of course, here's the question, do we want to be high up or low down? Because, if you think about it, up high, the sun wouldn't have set as long ago. But, ultimately, really what matters is the air mass above you. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to win on that front. I think we're going to win too. Okay, that's a good looking sunset there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, look at that. There. Look at that! Beautiful! Uh, well, it should be going. So. So yeah, this is from the GoPro that was pointed out the front of the plane. I'm running at four times regular speed because, you know, the GoPro has a pretty small lens, so it doesn't really bring out the details as much. And it should be clear that during all of this, the aircraft is flying on autopilot. We are checking for traffic. We want to make sure we can take over if something happens. Usually it still takes like a minute to get above the horizon, even from this distance, I expect. Yep. Also, I pointed the plane a bit more to the west to make sure we were maintaining legal separation from those clouds. Or maybe it's cancelled. Yeah, I'm trying to get my wife to text me. But, come on. Come on, 5G. You can oh, do they, it. Wait, there it there is. There it is. There it is, baby. Alright, cool. Oh, wow. Seeing this from the Part. air. Pretty sure we're clear of those clouds. <laughs> I'm glad I made that small course adjustment. Oh, it's so much brighter being close. All right, this is pretty bitching. Plume's getting bigger, that's awesome. Yeah, oh, you can see the trail now. You can actually see a plume. So yeah, you can see the first stage burned out, stage separation, and the second stage continuing to ascend up. And then, of course, the plume starts to expand out, and you get the jellyfish. And inside that, we could also see the booster and the fairings that had separated. So the best camera I had on board was this uh, Sony Alpha with, with a 50 millimeter lens. And uh, it was a whole lot better in terms of its color and uh, the noise. The only problem was I recorded the video in 1080p and it was handheld with one hand because, of course, the other hand and the eyes are doing things to make sure the plane is flying correctly. You know, I'm still maintaining my traffic scan. I'm looking at my instruments, making sure that I'm on the correct altitude and sort of roughly pointing this camera in the right direction, which is great if you want to stay alive and be a good pilot, but it's not great if you're actually looking for really cool footage. But nevertheless, with a bit of stabilization, uh, it is actually possible to see a number of small dots following the plume, just inside the plume. You can see one right at the bottom, that is the booster, and it flickers every time the booster is firing its reaction control thrusters. And then right just behind the second stage, there's a pair of small dots that come and go. Those are the fairings, and those of course are also heading down into the water to be recovered. And it's really cool that we can pick this out with just a 50 millimeter lens, which is like a portrait lens. It's not super high magnification or anything. So anyway, the rocket is heading south away from us at this point. And that booster, it is falling back. And at some point, it's going to have to perform an entry burn to decelerate before it hits the atmosphere too hard. Now, based upon the official landing zones, we figured out that the uh, entry burn would probably take place about 500 miles away from us, or about 800 kilometers. Now, that is over our horizon, but of course, it's doing the entry burn at an altitude of about 60 to 40 kilometers. So we hoped that we would see it, and we did see it which is pretty cool. I've never actually seen an entry burn for downrange recovery because it's so far out and usually there's clouds down near the horizon, but getting up lets us see further and it let us see over the horizon to this. So anyway, after that, it was time to head home. And good news was because we had started at such high altitude, we could actually take a slow descent down and we were hitting like 150 knots in my dinky little plane. And as the twilight faded, the landscape, the bay, it looked amazing. But look, I was amazed that we could actually see as much as we could. We didn't actually go that far south. We only went like 100 miles close. We didn't even go half the distance. And of course, the rocket's heading south, so it was headed away from us. There were people in LA posting iPhone videos, which were probably better than what we got because it was flying past them. 
This was something that wasn't really planned. It was kind of a last minute thing when we saw the timing of the launch and that myself and my friend both had free time. If I was really planning this, I would fly down to Lompoc or Santa Maria. I would get my media pass. I would get inside and I would bathe in the sound, the audio, because of course, one of the best parts of a rocket launch is the sound. And you can't hear any of that when you are flying in a plane. But on the other hand, I had never seen the downrange entry burn for a barge landing because it's essentially over the horizon for people who are at the launch site. And then throw in the bonus of a balloon sitting at 60,000 feet. That made for a pretty neat trip overall. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.